All right. Well, welcome back to the Save My Thyroid podcast. And with me, I have a very special guest, Dr. Amy Horneman, who is host of her own podcast, The Thyroid Fixer. And how are you doing, Amy? I'm great, Eric. Thank you so much for having me on. All right. Wonderful, wonderful. All right. So let's dive into Dr. Amy's bio here. So um, she, again, is known as the thyroid fixer. She's a woman on a mission to optimize thyroid patients around the world and give them their lives back using her proprietary transformational program, the FIX method. She's also the founder of the Institute for, for Thyroid and Hormone Optimization. So after her own experience of insufferable symptoms, mix, misdiagnoses, and improper treatment, Dr. Amy set out to help others who she knew were going through the same set of frustrations and who are on the same medical roller coaster. And with a focus on optimizing thyroid and hormone function and thus optimizing our patients, Dr. Amy looks at you as a unique individual and not just a lab value. She examines all factors that tie into thyroid dysfunction and thyroid symptoms and fixes you to give your life back, which is, I assume, why it's called the thyroid fixer. <laughs> and that's the goal. Yeah, exactly. Well, why don't you start off by giving a little bit of your backstory, how you began, how you started fixing other people's thyroid glands. And obviously you do more than just the thyroid, the focus like oh, with yeah. Graves, Hashimoto's, it's more immune, but, but let's, let's talk a little bit about your backstory. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, so many of us in this health space, it's that pain to purpose story. It's going through something ourselves that brings us into helping others. So if we rewind 20 some years ago, I was actually competing in figure competitions, which is kind of like bodybuilding, but you know, softer, more feminine. You still got to get on stage though in a bikini. So I was doing that. I was doing fitness modeling too. And listen, I do not come from a family of skinny minis. I, my family has obesity and type two diabetes. And so I always would have to, and I'm short. So I would always have to diet down and really work at it, but I knew what to do. I knew how my body would respond. I had done it many, many times before. This one particular show that I was getting ready for, and I mean, the diet is, you know, chicken, broccoli, asparagus, fish. You're going to the gym twice a day. And this one particular show I was getting ready for, I started gaining weight instead of losing. And I mean, 20 plus pounds. And I stopped weighing myself after I hit 20 pounds because I didn't want to see the scale go up anymore. And I just started feeling, I mean, I was not myself. I was depressed. I was fatigued. My hair was falling out. And I went, just like many of your listeners, doctor to doctor, saying, listen, I know my body. I know something's off. Please do something and tell me what is going on, right? And they're all saying, you're normal, you're fine. Normal, air quotes. You're normal, you're fine. Just eat less and exercise more. I was like, are you kidding me? There's no possible way to actually eat less than I am or exercise more than I already am. So they gave me the runaround. You know, a lot of my patients say, get the, well, you're just getting older. You have to learn to live with it. Everything looks fine on your labs. And, you know, back then I didn't know anything about labs. I don't even know what they tested and didn't test because I was just a patient, just like all of you. I was just a patient trying to figure out what the hell was going on with me. So seventh doctor finally touches my throat and says, swallow. And she goes, well, you have a goiter, you know, we're going to ultrasound it. We're going to run more tests, but you have Hashimoto's. So I leave there and I'm like, yes, this is awesome. I have an answer and a pill. So this is going to fix all of my problems. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to feel like myself again. Five months later, nothing, no, no change whatsoever. So I always joke, I'm pretty sure, Eric, I'm pretty sure that we had gateway computers back then, like the big box ones. And I went on there. And I found this thing called T3 and it just, you know, I, I saw all this research that T3 works really well with T4. And of course I was on Synthroid, like many people are stuck on in the beginning. And I bring this information to my doctor. I say, look at this, this T3 thing looks like it re works really well with T4. How about we do that? She goes, I'm not going to do that. I said, I'm going to find somebody who will. So I finally went into the functional integrative medicine space. I kept hearing this guy's name. You know, when you hear it three times, it's the universe telling you something. So I go see this guy, changes my life. He is now my mentor. He got me on the path at literally getting my life back, doing the right tests, doing the right treatment, supplements, nutrition, medication, the whole deal. And I, that's when my career changed. Because I thought, you know, if I went through that frustration, I mean, I, I was crying in my car after the sixth doctor told me, 
your normal. I was crying in my car because I just wanted an answer. I said, you know what? This is unacceptable. I need to get out there and help other people that are going through these frustrations that I went through because I'm just one little person in Erie, PA. There's plenty of other people out there that are suffering. So that's why I'm here. I went to um, functional medicine training, got my master's, got my doctorate. Now I'm in this space helping others. All right. Wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing that. And so in the bio that I gave, you know, one of the things we mentioned or my, I mentioned is that you do more than just obviously just look at the labs. It's, you don't yeah. treat just you, you want to treat the whole person. But right. we are going to focus on thyroid blood chemistry because we do look at labs. Same thing here on my side. You know, I think labs are important. It's just not the only thing. And unfortunately, many medical doctors, that's all they do is they look at maybe more than the TSH sometimes. Unfortunately, a lot of them just look at the TSH and then they'll just give medication for, you know, Hashimoto's, again, thyroid mm -hmm. hormone replacement, you yep. know, for hyperthyroidism graves, anti-thyroid medication, unless if they resort to ablation or yep. thyroid surgery. So um, what are some of the, as far as thyroid labs that you do besides, well, I guess TSH would be one, but yeah. But why don't you yeah discuss some of the labs? the must do's, right? So the must haves with thyroid labs that listen, if you don't have these, we really can't tell what's going on. So you start with the TSH and like Dr. Eric said, if you're lucky, you're going to get a free T4 if you're lucky. So we might see those, but quite honestly, that doesn't give me the whole picture whatsoever. We absolutely need a free T3 because T3 is the active thyroid hormone. I'm sure you talk a lot of, about that on the show, active thyroid hormone. We want a free T3 level. We want the reverse T3 level, which is the anti-thyroid hormone. And then, of course, we want your TPO and TGA antibodies because I want to know if you have Hashimoto's, even if you've had your thyroid taken out. I have many patients that go, well, I don't have a thyroid anymore. I go, I know. I'm still going to check your antibodies because antibodies can still be present even after thyroid removal or ablation. So, those are all of the thyroid labs that I like. And then, of course, like you said, Eric, I, I, I look at the symptoms. Yeah, I, I always say both and. We do both and. So, yes, we have to do the thyroid, but then we also have to look at your hormones. We have to look at insulin. We have to look at nutrients and all those other factors that come together so beautifully to help your thyroid medication work better or help your thyroid, if you still have it, work better. So we have to pair all that up with your symptoms into one big, beautiful picture and, and look at all of that. Yeah, no, that's, that's wonderful. And that's, that's what I do too. I, I definitely recommend, of course, a full thyroid panel. I will say re reverse T3, and we could talk a little bit about reverse T3. Mm -hmm. I don't do it anymore on my Graves patients. Cause I, you know, what hyperthyroidism Graves, you know, and, and most of my patient base has hyperthyroidism. And I, I just find that, I mean, because of the hyperthyroidism, not surprisingly, pretty much everybody has an elevated reverse T3. So it's yeah. a little bit different in the hypothyroid world. Uh, and again, we could talk about that. But again, pretty much, I, I would say oh, just about everybody who's hyper has that elevated reverse yeah. T3. And when you sure. correct the hyperthyroidism, often that'll resolve. Talking about TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. So can you explain why you don't want to rely on TSH alone? I see so many patients in the, in the hypo space, or again, they, they have gone through hyperthyroidism, they've gone through graves, and now they either had treatment with medication, they had it removed, they had radioactive iodine. Now we are replacing with thyroid hormone replacement, if that's the case, if they had a removal or, or ablation. And now we have, we're looking, if, if we rely on the TSH, the TSH can basically lie because if we're replacing with medication, that's going to go down. And especially if we're replacing with medication that contains T3, because if you had your thyroid removed, guess what? We have to replace with T4 and T3. So if we're replacing with medication that, that contains T3, that's naturally going to go down. I've also seen it go down below a one with T4 only medication, which it's kind of more rare, but it does happen. So then you're in a situation where you go to your conventional doc, that TSH is, let's say, you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.01. And your doctor freaks out and thinks that you're hyper. Meanwhile, you're like, no, doc, I was hyper last year. Remember we treated me and now I'm gaining weight and my hair is falling out and I'm tired. I'm sure as hell not hyper. 
Right. So if you rely on that TSH alone, a person is going to look hyper, but not be, you have to look at all the other hormones. You have to look at the actual thyroid hormones since TSH is a pituitary hormone. It is not a thyroid hormone. So you can't rely on TSH alone to get the full picture of what is actually going on in a person's body. Agreed. Th thanks for explaining. That's why I was looking for the pituitary hormone, which I knew knew you would get, would get to that. Yeah. And um, yeah, so perfect, perfect explanation. So I mentioned that in hyperthyroid patients, I typically don't test for reverse T3 anymore. But wh why do you recommend reverse uh, testing for reverse T3 in your hypothyroid patients, which I do too. I, I do see some patients with hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's. And why do you find reverse T3 to be valuable? Yeah, so with if reverse T3 is high, so let's say we are using thyroid hormone replacement, we're using, you know, NDT or T4, T3 combinations, because if they've had their thyroid removed, ablated, or they have Hashimoto's and it's, it's slowly being destroyed and we're catching them in the later stages, we use that medication, that T4 can convert to reverse T3. So if a, if a person is on too much T4 medication, maybe not enough T3, or the other factors that cause reverse to go up, inflammation, high insulin, estrogen dominance, low iron status, anemia, if you don't have enough iodine, zinc, magnesium, all of that, all of that can push up reverse T3 since reverse T3 is basically a survival mechanism of your body. So, but if that's high and you're walking around trying to live life and do a job and raise a family and, and, and run a business, you're going to be in survival mode all the time. And it might just mean that we need to adjust your medication or look deeper at what's causing that reverse T3 to be elevated and fix that so that you're not, your body's not walking around literally in a, in a protective survival mode all the time. Because you don't want to, listen, when you're in the ICU or the ER, the reverse T3 can be high. And, and like you said, Dr. Eric, if, if you're a Graves patient, you kind of are in this autoimmune flare where your reverse T3 is going to go high because it's saying, listen, we don't need any more thyroid hormone. Stop. It's, there's too much anyways. Yep. And, and, and so that makes sense. But if you're hypo or you're on the other side of graves where you've already had the surgery or the RAI, then we don't want you walking around a survival state anymore because now we're replacing that thyroid hormone. And we want that to actually work in your body to make you feel good. So we don't, we no longer want you in that high reverse T3 state. You don't need to be in survival mode anymore. All right. Makes sense. Thank you for that explanation. Yeah. And let's talk a little bit about optimal ranges because we both agree that we don't want to just rely on the lab ranges, which again, most medical doctors do. They just look at the, again, that usually they'll just test the TSH and maybe the free T4, as you said, but even if they look at free T3, they're just they usually will say everything's okay if it's not red flag by the lab. So can you talk a little bit about lab ranges versus optimal ranges? Oh yeah. This is, this is, yeah, this is a big thing, big thing for everybody. I heard Mark Hyman once describe it. So I have to give him credit that standard lab value ranges are like the side of a barn. So if you stand 50 yards back and I give you a ball and you throw it at the barn, you're probably 50 feet back, you're going to hit the side of the barn. But if I put a target on the barn, it's going to be a little tougher to get in that target, but that target is the functional optimal range. That is where we know as functional practitioners that you will feel better as a person. Your life will be much, much better if you are optimal. So in the case of, let's take free T3, because I just had a patient today, right? Free T3 is 2.4. The cutoff of the lab value range is 2.3. She didn't get flagged. She didn't get that little L. It's not red. So unless you get that little L or the little H next to your lab value, your doctor's probably not paying attention to it and what it means. To me, as a thyroid practitioner, I'm looking at that going, oh man, this is bad. This is low. We want you at 3.5 or above, or for any listeners that might be out of the country, we want it in the upper quadrant of the range. Now, that being said, some people even do better when that free T3 is above range, because most labs will cut it off at a four or 4.5. So some people do, do really well at a six. Uh, some people do really well at a 10. And that doesn't mean that they're hyper because you have to look at the whole picture and how they feel and what we're actually doing with them medication wise. 
but you can't, you, you cannot go by that standard lab value range or you could be left feeling like garbage. You have to go by the optimal ranges and then take it one step further and find your optimal. All right. Thank you. And, and just to clarify for those with hyperthyroidism, mm -hmm. you know, so, so you are talking probably more what hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's, if they're taking thyroid hormone replacement, you're not as concerned right. if they're hyper, but if someone with hyperthyroidism has like a free T3 of 10 and chances are their free T4 is elevated too, then then of right. course we want to, we, and that's why we want to yeah. look at the whole picture if, if TSH is depressed and free T3, free T4 elevated and the person's hyper, that's yeah. a completely different story, but you're giving a situation where with some what Hashimoto's again might be on thyroid or, uh, hormone replacement. And then I agree, some labs actually go as low as 2.0 I've seen. Yeah. So someone might have a free T3 of 2.1. Right. And again, the, most medical doctors won't look at, unless maybe if the TSH is elevated because the free T4 and the free T3 are low enough to bring that TSH out of range, yes. then they'll pay attention to that TSH. But yeah. if free T4 is, you know, again, on the, you know, let's say 0.7 and free T3 is 2.1 and TSH is like 4.2, which is in with the, within most lab ranges, you know, they'll usually ignore it. Maybe if the person presents with some symptoms, possibly, but, right. but yeah, so thanks. Thanks for that uh, explanation as well. And, and yeah, if I could expand just a little bit, just kind of going off what you said, um, is that you really have to look at the whole picture. So I'm sure you get this question a lot too. People will, will write in, they'll text you, they'll message you on Facebook. They'll go, well, well, Dr. Eric, what, what should my free T3 level be? And you're like, well, okay, just like I gave your listeners, 3.5 or above is the optimal range for me, but it's the whole picture. So just like you said, if you're walking around 3.5 or 4, and then your free T4 is, a, I don't know, a 7, and then your, you know, your TSH is 0 0.001, okay, now you're in a hyper state. So you have to look at that whole picture and then ask the person those four important words that we normally don't hear in conventional medicine, how do you feel? And then put that all together as well. So it isn't just about, I know we are talking about optimal ranges, but it's not just about one individual lab value because I get that question all the time. Where should my free T3 be? I'm like, well, I can give you a general answer, but it's about looking at how everything is working together. Yeah, and, and again, if someone... Getting back to the example with somewhat Hashimoto's, if they're on thyroid hormone replacements, and if it's a little bit on the higher side, but they're feeling great and everything else looks good, then you might be happy. But on the other hand, if it's on the higher side and they're feeling hyper and they're not feeling good and experiencing hyper symptoms, then it might be a good idea to adjust the thyroid hormone, right? Um, medicate, exactly. Whatever they're they're taking. You, you said you take you don't take desiccated. You said you take um, actual T3. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yes, I am a T3 only patient. Okay. And, okay. Yep. You're only T3. Okay. I'm only Wonderful. T3. So, all right. So, uh, just because, as you know, many, many medical doctors only give, uh, you know, T4s. Here's a question that, you know, so this is going a little bit off track, but if someone needs T3, but their doctor just refuses, I assume you would just say probably go to another doctor, maybe see a functional medicine practitioner if they, yep. you know, let's say if they do test for free T3 and if it's on the lower side, free T4 looks good, free T3 a little bit low, you would say maybe see someone else? <laughs> yeah. Well, you start with testing. So my rule of thumb is if you ask your doctor for a full thyroid panel with all the tests that you and I just went over and they say, no, it's time to get a new doc, uh, because that's the first test. If your doctor won't even, that's a test for your doctor. If your doctor won't test you as a patient to get that full picture and you're going in and you're saying, hey, doc, listen, these are my symptoms, X, Y, Z, and they won't even listen to you and they don't want to see what's on paper right in front of them and have answers to why you're feeling the way you're feeling, time to move on. Then part B is let's say you do have a low T3, free T3. And, and you do the same thing that I did. You know, hey, um, I was listening to this chick and she's a thyroid expert and she said this thing about T3 being kind of awesome. And can we, you know, I'm on T4 only. And look, my free T3 is only a 2.1. And oh, by the way, I'm gaining weight and my hair's falling out. I'm really tired. And your doctor says, no, it is time to move on. Now, that being said, 
I do have patients that they, they want to go the natural route and that's fine. So if you're taking T4 and it's not converting properly and your T3 is low and let's say your reverse T3 is high, we can do all of the other things to really help that conversion happen. If you, if you want to you know, stay on your medication or if you really are stuck, I have a lot of patients in Australia and the UK and Canada where I can't, I can't prescribe for them. And so we have to do it the natural route. We have to push that conversion of T4 over to T3 and take out all the blocks that are impairing that conversion from happening. So it can be done naturally, but if you're here in the States, and, and you're on the struggle bus there, it's definitely time to get a new doc, go the functional route. Yeah. You got to pay out of pocket. Chances are insurance isn't going to cover it, but guess what? You're going to get more than five minutes with a functional doctor than you, that. Cause that's all you get with insurance at your current doctor at your PCP or your endocrinologist. So that that's absolutely what I would say. All right. Well, thanks for that. And Antibodies. So let's talk a little bit about thyroid antibodies. So there's, you know, you mentioned for Hashimoto's, there's thyroid peroxidase antibodies, the anti-thyroglobulin antibodies, and then um, Graves, there's thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins, which is a type of TSH receptor antibody. Mm -hmm. And so how important are antibodies to you to look at initially and to keep track of? And, you know, I, I know to you know, a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of patients, I don't want to say obsessed with the antibodies, but yeah. they, and again, Graves, Hashimoto's, they are immune system condition. Yep. So again, I, I, I like to look at antibodies too, but I want to get your opinion when it comes to thyroid antibodies. Yeah. So uh, we, we have to test for them because I want to know whether you have an autoimmune condition or not. I want to know whether you have Hashimoto's or not, or Graves disease. So we have to test initially. And we also want that baseline, right? We want to know like, where are you starting? Because here's the thing. Many times doctors won't test. So I'll see a patient after they've been through 10 years of testing or even 10 years of thyroid treatment, but they never had their antibodies tested or they had them tested once. So the testing part is, is important just to know whether or not there is an autoimmune condition present because we know with, with hypothyroidism, 90% of hypothyroidism is Hashimoto's. It might not get flagged right away. Oftentimes we see antibodies come up as a false negative. So we want to test multiple times to, to check that. Number two, we want to see if you're doing big jumps. I don't care about little jumps. And you're right. Patients will kind of get a little bit obsessed with antibodies. I'll get messages like, oh my gosh, my antibodies went up by 50. Yeah, so maybe you were stressed out or you got glutened at a restaurant. I don't, I'm not, I don't care about those little jumps or those little changes. But if your antibodies go from 100 to 3,800, um, we need to pause and take a look at that. So that's why I like testing, but not obsessing. It's just knowledge. It's just, it's just ongoing feedback, biofeedback for me and for the patient, but we, we don't hang our hat on the antibodies because it really, again, it comes back to how do you feel those four words? If a patient is feeling great, I mean, they're, they're great. Obviously we want to get your antibodies to zero, but if you're feeling amazing, and you're losing weight and you're living life and you have energy and your hair's growing. I don't care if your antibodies are hundred. I don't care if they're 200. We're going to keep working on it, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to obsess over that number because I want you feeling good. Does that make sense? Hopefully I, I, I know it's no. a long answer to a short question, but that kind of ties all those pieces together. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, it beats the opposite where someone's antibodies are looking great and they're still feeling lousy you know, just because again, there could be other imbalances as well. Yep. But, um, but yeah, no, it, it, it definitely makes sense. And when it comes to retesting, I guess a couple of questions. So one question is how frequently do you retest the thyroid panel? And then a second question that ties into it is, do you test the antibodies every single time you recommend a thyroid panel? So the first question, how often I get this asked a lot by my patients too. So general rule of thumb, if we're, we're doing a, an overhaul in their medication, depending on how much we changed, we'll probably in, in that beginning stage, we'll retest in four to six weeks just to kind of see what's going on. Then after that, and after we get them more optimized, we can space it out. But I always tell them, 
If you feel wonky, if anything is going awry, then we retest sooner. That you know, three month or four month or six month marker of when we're going to retest you is not set in stone. If you are gaining weight or you're feeling crappy again, or you feel, I, sometimes patients will say, I feel like I did before I started medication. What's going on? Especially with that whole NP recall. I was getting messages left and right. Like, why do I feel like garbage? Why do I feel like I did before I started meds? Why do I feel hypo again? Well, it was the medication. So obviously we need to test again. We need to test now because something's going on in your body. And, and we just retest sooner. Antibodies, I, I space them out maybe every other, every third test, we take a peek at them. Or again, will we put them in a full panel if somebody is feeling bad? Yes, absolutely. So we test every, if somebody reaches out and is like, what is happening? Then yeah, we test everything. Yeah, I, I take a similar approach. I can't say I, I recommend testing antibodies every single time. No. I mean, sometimes, again, endocrinologists differ. A lot of endocrinologists will just if they do test the antibodies, it'll just be the very first time and that's it. They'll never test yeah. for it again. But I do have some patients who are getting tests from their st still working with an endocrinologist and they, for whatever reason, they, they actually, not, not that I'm complaining, but they tested every single time the antibodies. So it really varies. And, but if I'm, if they're to get into testing through me, I mean, if they really want to test antibodies every single time, I'm not going to argue, but typically It'll be like, yeah, maybe every every other time it's something that, and and what hyperthyroidism again, it might be a little bit different because, yeah, what Hashimoto's uh, even initially, like you said, you might want to test more frequently, but um, what hyperthyroidism, definitely want to keep an eye on them, and then if they're on antithyroid medication, yeah. there's uh, other tests we'll want to look at, like looking at liver enzymes and making sure the white blood cell count isn't depressed. Speaking of that, so let, let's talk about other tests that you do, I assume you do like CBCs as far as blood tests, like mm -hmm. the basics, like CBCs with differential conference and metabolic panel. So do you want to talk a little bit about that as well? Definitely a long list. CBC with DEF, CMP, obviously love looking at hemoglobin A1C and insulin because most thyroid patients, whether hyper or hypo will have insulin resistance. Since the thyroid gland is the master, it's going to start throwing off your other hormones. So we want to look at all the hormones. Insulin's a hormone. So we want to look at that. We can't hang our hat on glucose because glucose can lie. So we want to test A1C and insulin. I like looking at a C-reactive protein for inflammation. Full hormone panel. Ladies, you have more than estrogen. So you need a full hormone panel that includes progesterone free and total testosterone because testosterone is very important for my ladies. It's often overlooked by conventional medicine as being important. And there is an optimal range for that too, for you to feel good. And then we look at pregnenolone. We look at DHEA. If we can get a four point salivary cortisol panel to look at adrenals, I like to do that. Obviously all the nutrients, right? So selenium, mag, iodine, vitamin D, vitamin D is a hormone. We look at that too, because that can get thrown off with hypo. I'm probably missing some in there, but those are the ones that like come immediately to mind. We'll run an Epstein-Barr virus panel too, Lyme disease panel, tick-borne illness, all those things that could drive up reverse T3, any kind of co-infection. We'll look at that as well. As far as Lyme, you, you test everybody, like run a Lyme panel on everybody, just out of curiosity or? You know, no, I don't. Um, it depends on the symptoms. So, you know, some people, it's just, it's obvious what's going on right? It's just, it's right here in black and white. But then as we get a little bit deeper, um, I have one patient that has long haulers from, co from C. I won't say it out loud so you don't get flagged. She has long haulers. And as we look, it's like, what's driving this? Okay. Epstein-Barr virus, listen, 90% of us have that too. So the question is, is it active or is it in its dormant state? And is there, is there a Lyme component too that's making her feel incredibly fatigued? Or is it just her thyroid? Or is it just the long haulers? So we want to rule that out when someone has that, that crushing fatigue and you look at their thyroid panel and you're like, but everything looks fine here. Or at least we have you optimized here. What else is going on that you're so tired? Your vitamin D is good. Zinc is good. This is good. You're checking all those boxes and you go, we better run like Lyme and Tickborn here because there might be something a little bit deeper. So I don't automatically run that. And if I am working with a patient that's working with their own practitioner, 
good luck getting a full line panel. You know, it'll just be the one marker. And I'll go, okay, we got to do this on the side because this isn't going to give us the information that we need. Yeah, I, I specifically asked you that question because I was diagnosed with chronic Lyme three years ago. So, uh, and I, I can't say I run a Lyme panel on, on everybody. I, I more frequently do test Epstein-Barr yeah. in a, a lot of my patients. And also with Lyme, just the, the regular labs, LabCorp, Quest Diagnostics, I don't find um, reliable. I mean, I'm, you might get lucky, but usually if I'm testing, I'm usually using a, a specialty lab to look more at, at Lyme and co-infections. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. but yeah, uh, and what hormones, so, so I agree with the adrenal saliva testing. I, you know, I've been doing that for years. I have done, I don't know if you do Dutch testing on some patients. The last few years I started doing dried urine testing on some patients. It really depends. Do you, when you test for hormones, do you mainly do it through the blood or do you, are you familiar with the Dutch or? Yeah, I'm familiar with Dutch. Um, you know, I'm still on the fence with that too. So I'll do it in, in patients that I feel like we need to compare both serum and urine and see the metabolites that we, we find in the Dutch test. But I'm all about saving patients money too. So if we can get the answers with a blood test that's covered by your insurance or that you can get on the cheap from Ulta Labs or ordering it yourself, let's go that route because that chest is expensive. And if we don't need it, we don't, we're not going to implement it and make you spend more money out of pocket. So we can get a lot from blood. And, you know, I mean, the jury, it is so split in our in our little world here of functional medicine as to, you know, you have the, it's, it's kind of like the iodine controversy, right? The Dutch hormone controversy. Dried urine is the best because we get the metabolites. No, that's after the urine's already processed it. You got to use blood. And so it's like you're hearing both sides and you're like, uh, I need to land somewhere here. So I, I kind of go back and forth too. I, I'm like you, I'll use the Dutch if it's absolutely necessary to get a bigger picture. All right. No, that sounds good. And then adrenals, do, do you, uh, saliva testing, you, you do you use what most patients to look at adrenals? Yeah, that's, that's the gold standard. You just can't, that's the one where I will say we need to use something other than blood. So the four point salivary cortisol panel, as many of your listeners know, it gives us that, that look of what your cortisol is doing throughout the day. And we, you can't just go by blood and have one morning marker. I mean, it'll give us some feedback, but I like to see what that cortisol half curve is doing. Is it is it actually in the right curve? Is it flatlined high? Is it flatlined low? So that really requires saliva to get an accurate measure. Yeah, great. And same here. You know, I, you know if I don't use... I use more saliva testing than the Dutch, the dried urine testing. If I do recommend that, I just add the adrenals onto that. But when I dealt with Graves, I did the saliva test and, you know, I've been using that for uh, quite a long time. And yeah, you definitely want to look at the circadian rhythm of cortisol and not just that single sample, which all, which could again be influenced by, you know, someone is nervous get going to a lab and they get that blood test or just then the right. withdraw itself sometimes can cause that cortisol to spike up. Yep. Yep. So, um, so one other question when it comes to testing that comes to mind is thyroid ultrasound. So this, mm -hmm. uh, obviously straying from the blood test and the saliva test this is completely different, but it does relate to, to thyroid. So do you recommend thyroid ultrasounds to your patients or mm -hmm. definitely? I do recommend it. Um, sometimes we can, Sometimes we can go off, I, it's it's that individual thing, right? So sometimes we can go off the blood and we know what's going on and there's no palpable goiters, nodules, no one's having trouble swallowing. We, we're not getting those kind of symptoms. But then on a case by case basis, if someone is having trouble swallowing, if they have a visual or palpable nodule, then we want to get an ultrasound. If they're in the latter stages of Hashimoto's where that thyroid gland is being destroyed, we want to get an ultrasound. I'm not sure where when you use it with with hyperthyroidism, but in in those cases, yes, I have a patient right now that just got an ultrasound because she could actually feel that something has grown, and and sure enough, one of her nodules has grown in size, so they're going to biopsy it. Okay, ultrasound, good in that case, really good, really helpful. But not everyone needs one. I, I recommend it as a baseline if you can get it, if your insurance covers it. Again, coming back to the saving money part. If it's black and white in front of me with the with the labs and I know what's going on and I know what we're going to treat and how we're going to treat it, I won't always say, oh, you must get an ultrasound because they might end up with a $300 bill, $500 bill for that. I agree. I, I don't think everybody needs it, even with hyperthyroidism. When I 
was diagnosed with Graves. Uh, I, I saw an endocrinologist at the time and she actually did not want to do a, an ultrasound, but I talked her into doing one just because I was willing to pay out of pocket. I, I didn't okay, have insurance yeah. at the time. And, you know, I just wanted to know. I was like, uh, you know, I'll just pay. It was a couple of hundred dollars. And I wanted to see. And if someone absolutely wants an ultrasound, but uh, but I can't say that it's necessary in every single person with hyperthyroidism, Graves' disease. And yeah, the same yep. with uh, hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's. So uh, wonderful. Well, yeah, this was a great discussion. I appreciate you um, sharing this information with uh, with my listeners. And any last words when it comes to uh, to any type of testing, whether it's you know thyroid testing or or other types of testing? You know, I, I mean, the main thing is is to to get the full picture all at once. I, I know you probably see this in your patients too, but I see conventional medicine do this willy nilly thing where with the thyroid, okay, well, we'll test TSH first. And if that's bad, then we'll do more testing. We'll do, you know, T3 and free T4. And then if that's a problem, then we'll come over here and we'll test your hormones and we'll test. It's like, why not do everything at once? Why not have everything right in front of you? So you can look at it like a puzzle and you're putting the pieces of the puzzle together. If I gave you a puzzle and I said, here you go, Eric, do this puzzle, but I'm only going to give you a quarter of it. I'm like, okay, well, I don't even know whether this is a corner or a middle piece. I have no idea. I don't even know what the picture is because you only gave me a quarter of the puzzle. We need the whole thing. We need all the information at once. So you have to be your own patient advocate sometimes. Sometimes you have to order your own testing to get the full picture. If there's little pieces that are missing in your puzzle, you got to get those, you know, just demand it. I mean, testing gives us answers. We pair that testing up with how you feel and things can change. And that's where the magic happens. But unless we have everything in front of us, how do we know? You know, we don't want to throw darts. We don't want to say like, well, I think mm, maybe you have low testosterone. I think maybe you're estrogen dominant. And then we start treating that and it's wrong. No, let's get some numbers. Let's get some answers. All right. No, that sounds great. And um, yeah, I agree. I, when, when I recommend testing to my patients, uh, again, I do take into consideration not everybody could afford everything, but I will give options too. And obviously, ultimately, it's up to the patient. So even if I yeah. think something is not optional, it really is optional because they might. So if, if we need to further prioritize then of course we will do so. But I, I do think we, you know, we want to get answers and we don't want to just rely on basic blood tests and same thing with adrenals. I like to look at adrenals like you and do saliva testing and not yeah. just, uh, yeah. So, so I think we're on the same page with that. And uh, again, thank you so much for uh, getting together here. Uh, you shared some wonderful information. Where can people learn more about you? I know your podcast is one, the Thyroid Thyroid Fixer podcast, correct? Yep, that's it. Thyroid Fixer podcast on all podcast platforms. And then they can also find me by going to my website, dramyhorneman.com. And if they're interested in booking a call, they can book a free discovery call. You'll be talking to a member of my team. We can go over how we can work together if you are in that in that hypo state, because I know a lot of your patients, a lot of your patients do swing from hyper to hypo, from Graves to Hashi, correct? Do you see that a lot? O over time, of course, yeah. a lot of people do it quickly because they're on the anti-thyroid medication, but yeah. also a lot of people with Graves have also the thyroid peroxidase antibodies. Some of them also have those anti-thyroid globulin antibodies. So over time, yeah. Some people do uh, become hypo. And that's also why, again, we want to try to address that immune system component too, to try, mm -hmm. try to prevent them from getting to that state. But so Thyroid Fixer is the podcast, again, on all platforms. And uh, and, and website is dramyhorneman.com. Mm -hmm. Yep. DR and then my name.com. So I'm sure you'll put that in the show notes. They can yes, find it. Yes, yeah, definitely will. So. All right. Well, thanks again. Appreciate your time, Dr. Amy. And uh, yeah, we'll have to have a part two in the future. Definitely. Thank you, Dr. Eric. Thanks for having me on.